Lord, as, uh, as we come into Your presence again, we once again give You thanks and praise for who You are. We thank You for how You reveal Yourself to us. Um, your compassion, Your mercy, Your grace, Your loving kindness and steadfast love. Your patience. We are so grateful for all of that being applied to our lives. We thank You, Lord, for how You forgive us of our sin, iniquity, and transgression. We thank You, Lord, how You draw, your, draw us to Yourself. We thank You, Lord, for how You number our days. How You carry us along. We thank You, Lord, for all of this and more. Lord, um, we rejoice with Russ who received some good news on his health as they continue to watch him. And so, Lord, we thank You and rejoice in that. We continue to lift up Lori to You as she continues to recover and take whatever steps that are next for her. In the healing process and her recovery, thank you. Lord, we lift up uh, Ruth's brother Robert to you. Uh, he has entered hospice. And we ask, Lord, that you would be with the health care providers, uh, those who have watch care over him and grant them wisdom and compassion and mercy and grace <clears throat> that they may indeed show that to Robert and that you would make your presence known to him as you carry him along uh, in this last leg of life. Lord, uh, be with the family and uh, sustain them in Your comfort and grace and mercy. Lord, as we turn to Your Word, we ask that You would build us up in faith and love and hope. You would be pleased, Lord, to bless us that we may indeed be blessed, but that we might be a blessing to others. That You would be pleased to magnify Your name in each of our lives. And that it would be pleasing in Your sight to help us to be steadfast Strengthen in the inner man. Remaining true and faithful to Your call upon our lives. We give You the glory and the praise through Christ our Lord. Amen. If you haven't already done so, I invite you to turn with me to Ephesians 4, 17 through 24. We're going to read that once again. We're going to finish this section of Scripture as we continue thinking about uh, mid-walk course corrections.
Not that it always does any good, but I'm going to put my clock up here too so I can... It does not... Oh no, wait a minute. I may not get to do that. I just thought I could just click on the app. Now it wants me to buy something. There. I had to find the X. Okay, starting at verse 17 of Ephesians 4, Paul writes, Now this I say and testify in the Lord, that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to their hardness of heart. They have become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. But that is not the way you learned Christ, assuming that you have heard about Him and were taught in Him as the truth is in Jesus. To put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desire, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds, and to put on the new self, created after the likeness of God, in true righteousness and holiness. And may God bless His Word to our lives, now and always. As we begin thinking about the conclusion of this passage this morning, we're thinking again of our need to make mid-walk course corrections. And this is a good thing. It's, it's okay to admit that, yeah, sometimes I need to make sure I stay on the road, stay on the right path. It's a necessary thing. If this were not the case, we would be stuck, right, in old patterns of living that could never glorify our Lord. What did we see last time? Well, last time we saw that unless something or someone intervenes, you will remain on the same course you were on previously. In order for you and I to make course corrections in our walk with the Lord, we must embrace something very basic and something that we must never forget. That is, to embrace the truth in Jesus. To embrace the truth in Jesus. To embrace the truth that is in Jesus means that there are some foundational truths to which our lives must remain anchored as believers in Christ. It is important for us to remember the thrust of Paul's exhortation here. His overall concern is that you walk no longer as the Gentiles also walk in the futility of their mind. Now, Some of you might be thinking that you have been a Christian a long time. And maybe you're thinking that you grew up in a Christian home, perhaps, and that would be great. I, I, well, I don't think I did. I wouldn't call it quite like that. And you have never embraced a pagan Roman culture, such as Paul was writing again. But even in that kind of situation, that is, growing up in a Christian home or having been a Christian a long time, we need to be aware that the world still tries to press you into its mold. And this should never surprise us, beloved. The Apostle is always concerned about this kind of thing on behalf of the church. In fact, he writes in Romans 12.2, some of you probably have it memorized, do not be conformed, that's, our, that's the word for molded, molded to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. So beloved, the threat from the world is always there no matter what your upbringing was. It does not matter your upbringing as the world will always seek to batter your life in conforming you to it. I think of the last parable that Jesus told in the Sermon on the Mount and 
he compared two different kinds of houses, remember? One was founded upon the rock and one was merely built on sand. And what happened? The storms came against those houses and beat against it. And only one of them stood. The one that was founded and built correctly. Now this is why Paul says in Ephesians 4.20, but that is not the way you learned Christ. That is not the way you learned Christ. We mentioned two things that we should have learned in coming to know the Lord salvifically. The first has to do with the forgiveness of sins. That's something very basic when you share the Gospel with someone else or someone sharing it in the past with you. When someone is asked the question, have you received Christ as your Savior? These days, we need to communicate that from which we need saving. These days, people don't always know what you're talking about. And they need to be educated. They need to be... uh, They need to have you share with them what's going on. What the Gospel is all about. The world so squeezes people into its mold that there's not much conscious thought about sin and what it is and who it is against and who it affects. Sin is first and foremost right against the living and true God. I think of David in Psalm 51. Well, he wasn't a perfect guy, right? And in this moment, he had committed adultery and he had committed murder. Now, his sin affected other people, but what did he say in Psalm 51? Against you, and you only have I sinned in your sight. Right? That is, it is first and foremost against the living and true God. And sin is defined in relationship to Him. So the Scripture describes it as falling short of God's glory, right? Romans 3.23 For all have sinned and fall short of God's glory. The Scripture also describes it as lawlessness. God's glory, of course, is who He is in His fullness as God. It is the perfections of all that He is in His attributes. The law, the Word of God, is a revelation of the perfections of God. So when you violate it, you are violating God's character. His standard. Each one of us needs to understand that sin ultimately destroys you as well. When, when given over to it, it, it leads you into destruction. Uh, sin dresses itself up, right? Makes itself appealing. Hey, if you'd only veer off this way, you'd have a great time. You'd solve all all your problems very easily, right? It seeks to draw you away, and it doesn't appear as ugly. It appears as something beautiful because it wants to entrap you, deceive you, and then entrap you, and then enslave you, and then destroy you, and then kill you. The end of it all is the second death, the lake of fire. But sin is not just vertical in its dimensions, it's also horizontal, isn't it? In other words, sin affects our relationships. Not only do we sin against God, but we are able to sin against each other. There are far-reaching effects of sin. Marriages. And families are destroyed because of sin. It's a fact of of life. Parents are heartbroken over wayward children. And, you know, the reverse is true. Children are heartbroken over wayward parents. 
All kinds of destructive things can happen because of sin left unchecked. Because we're too proud to humble ourselves before God and before each other. Now we said that there are two basic truths when you first learn of Christ. Forgiveness of sins is one. The second has to do with new life. And we really shouldn't talk about one without really talking about the other. Be able to condense it down if we only have a short time when sharing with someone. But we need to talk about not only the problem, but the solution and what God has for us. That is new life. Sharing our faith is not just about sin and its consequences and the ultimate consequence in the second death. It is also about life and overcoming and its ultimate end of being in God's presence, enjoying Him forever, wherever He is. It is a renewal of all things, a new heaven and new earth, as Peter puts it, in which righteousness dwells. But it is not something that we simply sit around waiting to have happen to us. It is something with which we actively engage. It is important that we understand this aspect of it. We live out our lives in the power of the Holy Spirit and the guidance of the Word of God. We are new creations in Christ. We are to embrace more and more of that newness of life which the Lord our God has given to us. There's more to it than these basic truths, but but these kinds of things get us started. And these kinds of things are what gets a new believer started in the walk of the Lord. The Apostle Paul adds this in Ephesians 4.21, Assuming that you have heard about Him and were taught in Him as the truth is in Jesus. When did we hear about Jesus? Each one of us has heard about Jesus in the call of the Gospel upon our lives, right? When someone or you went to a a Billy Graham crusade or some other kind of crusade and you heard the Gospel message or your parents talked to you about it, You heard the message of truth, the word of truth, the gospel, and that was a call upon your life. And you heard about it, right? What about him and in the gospel, however briefly, were we taught in him? We've already covered some of what we should have been taught regarding sin and new life, what God promises to those who believe in him. So if you share the gospel with somebody, make sure you include include these basic truths. Help them face what the Scripture have to say, not what you have to say. Why is it so important that we are taught in Christ? Why is that so important? It is important because the truth is in Jesus. The truth isn't found in anywhere else it's in him he is the way and the truth and the life jesus himself said that he who sins is a slave of sin there's no escaping it and jesus continues in verse 36 by saying if the son sets you free you will be free indeed You certainly want a medical doctor to tell you the truth about your physical condition, don't you? I mean, you don't want him or her to lie to you. It it sometimes, well, we talk about, we've talked about the sobering, the the sobering human condition. When a doctor is talking to you about your physical condition. You want them to be honest about what's going on. Why? Well, so that you might receive the proper treatment to cure you. Right? If he lies to you and treats according to the lie, has he helped you? No. 
You want a lawyer to tell you the truth of your situation so that he might properly defend you or advocate for you, right? The unbeliever needs the truth about both sin and new life. He needs to be given an honest evaluation. An evaluation as God sees it, not as fellow human beings see it. Oh, that per- he's, he's a pretty good guy. He doesn't need what you have to say. No, everybody needs it, you see. It's about what God has to say. Not the estimation of other people. And the believer needs to have the truth about how to continue to embrace that newness of life. Remember what we said when we started this series. This letter is about God's purposeful plan of redemption accomplished in Christ and applied to His people. From the moment we cross the threshold from the end of chapter 3 into chapter 4, this has been the concern of the Apostle Paul. Not that application didn't happen before, but he's really zeroing in on it since chapter 4, verse 1. We need to know how the previous truth that he revealed is applied to us, is applied to the church. Think about his situation. Did he know for sure how the adjudication of his case would turn out? That is, the Apostle Paul sitting in prison, waiting to go before Caesar. Although he speaks of the confidence in being released, he also entertains the notion that this would be it for him. For me to live as Christ and die is gain, he said to the Philippian church. Thinking that if this should be what God desires, then so be it. And he is seeking to safeguard the church. He's seeking to safeguard us. You and I. He's seeking to lay the groundwork so that the church might continue and grow and be refined. And how does he do that? We turn to that next. As we think about course corrections then, we embrace the proper change dynamic found here in verses 22 through 24. What is the change dynamic? It is the three-factored process whereby the Lord transforms you from old to new. What is involved? What is involved is identifying that which is associated with the world system and laying it aside. It involves developing a biblical way of thinking and understanding. and So instead of walking in the futility of our minds. He wants a biblical way of thinking and understanding. And lastly, it involves incorporating into your life more and more of the likeness of God. This is the short answer. So let's dig into it a little further. We are to put off the old self. Put off the old self. Paul says it this way in Ephesians 4.22 to put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires. What is the old self? It's the body of flesh. Notice that it belongs to your former manner of life. But notice also that it is corrupt through deceitful desires. I want you to understand, first of all, that this doesn't have anything to do with whether or not you grew up in a Christian home or have been, or have been a uh, Christian for a long, long time. It goes to how well you may or may not have been trained in the Christian walk. Sometimes we assume, maybe sometimes we assume too much about others. But even if you receive the finest of Christian training, it does not mean that the world doesn't try to infiltrate your life. And that's the point. 
This is a battle with the world system that seeks to put you into its mold. This is speaking to the old self which is habituated to conform to the world, the body of flesh. How does the world's ways seek to affect us? It seeks to affect us in thought, word, attitude, and deed. It is important for us to understand this. Remember how the unbelieving mind is affected by the fall? Remember that it is corrupt in the way that it reasons about God's world. It refuses to acknowledge that God is back of everything. It refuses to acknowledge His providence. Boy, I thank God for His providence. It refuses to acknowledge God's hand at work in His creation. We kind of think of Him as a quasi-involved creator sometimes. No, He's not interested. You know, we hear it, right? He's not interested in whether the... Well... They're playing right now, so I'm going to use it as an illustration. He's not interested in whether the Husker women's basketball team beats the Iowa Hawkeyes or not. He's just not that interested. Now let me ask you a question. When the ladies are, as they're playing right now, or should be, Well, in fact, right down the road from us. In fact, I'll be back. No, I'm kidding. As they are playing, do you think he's interested in whether those athletes honor him and glorify him? Absolutely. Do you think he's interested in that game? Yeah, absolutely. Because he desires to be honored by all things. All things. Right? Whether then you eat or drink. The most mundane of things, right? We hardly take a thought of it. Oh, I'm thirsty. Get a glass of water. A little hungry. Grab a little food. Whether then you eat or drink, or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. So the unbelieving mind tries to distract you by saying God isn't interested in the little things of life. Yes, He is. Because He wants all of creation to glorify Him. It counts what you and I hold dear as foolishness. We saw that, right? A couple of weeks ago. It's foolishness to Him. We've talked about our posture in life and the attitude we are to embrace, right? The world also has a particular posture that it wants you to have in life. It wants you to embrace the newest fad that comes down the pike, right? If you want to fit into society, get on the whatever kind of train that's going by. It wants you to act contrary to what you hold dear in Christ Jesus our Lord. And it seeks to deceive you in the process. It it makes itself look good and appealing. And it makes itself look like it's to your advantage to go ahead and go along with it. It wants to make you think that it's to your advantage that you follow the course the world wants you to have. We've covered much by way of examining the sobering condition of humanity. I don't think we need to repeat all of that here. We don't have time. But it includes thoughts, words, deeds, and attitudes. But it is much more than that. The world is fighting very hard to get you back on its course. You see, the previous course. It wants you to sort of jump the tracks, as it were, and, and get off the current course and come back. Get back on the cool course. But it's not so cool. And it's a very good at infiltrating your life. 
Paul's exhortation to you and I involves being able to identify where it is seeking to infiltrate and putting it aside. We're to put it aside like an old garment that is no longer wanted. Much of Christian counseling involves this very thing. It involves helping others who are struggling to identify old patterns that are holding them back. Marriages, parent-child relationships, all manner of things, work relationships, um, acquaintance relationships, church relationships, all kinds of things that go on where the world seeks to disrupt and confuse and distort. Try and help you feel justified in certain things. And when you all feel justified in certain things, then you run into conflict. And no one wants to resolve it. No one wants to, to come to Jesus. And remember, it's in Him where we have reconciliation. And that He has killed the enmity, the hostility. We are to be renewed. Verse 23, what is it to be renewed? Paul says very clearly, in the, this renewal is in the spirit of your minds. How often are we to be renewed? For the rest of our lives. For the rest of our lives. That attitude of renewal needs to be there. Never be satisfied. Never be sa- Don't beat yourself up, but don't ever be satisfied. Continue the trajectory of growth, in other words. In other words, renewal never stops this side of heaven. It is an ongoing reality. We could legitimately translate the first part of the verse and to keep being renewed. Keep being renewed. Why keep being renewed? Because when we fail to keep being renewed, the world gains a foothold. It's as simple as that. We do not want the world to gain a foothold in any of our lives, do we? We were introduced to the unbelieving mind at the beginning of this section of Scripture. There it was said that the unbeliever walks in the futility of their minds. The course takes them over there, according to the world. How do we avoid that? The short answer is that we need to be trained to think God's thoughts after Him. How does God think about this? What does His Word say about my situation? What direction I need to go or should go? or? the like. We need to understand that God is not just in the picture, beloved. He's not just He's not just part of the landscape. Right? He's just not He's not simply a character in the overall scheme of things. He is the picture. He is the picture. Psalm 139, where can I go from your presence? And wherever the psalmist said he could possibly go, even exaggerating a little bit, his conclusion was, you are there. I can't escape you. He is the picture. We need to understand that this is God's creation. We spoke last week of living within the structure that God has set forth, right? To seek to live outside of that is by definition futility. To refuse to acknowledge God is futility. Because why? Because you live in His world. A renewed mind recognizes that this is God's world. A renewed mind also recognizes God's course in life is best. His course is a further avenue of blessing and favor. The avenue of destruction 
or the avenue of life and blessing. You see, those are the choices. Those are the two paths. A renewed mind recognizes that it is wise to submit to the Lord of glory and His will. Even if it is hard, how do we go about having our minds renewed? Well, let's start right here in Ephesians. What does the, course, what does the world say about its current course? The world says that we have obliteration to look forward to. That is, if you take the atheistic, nat- naturalistic view, obliteration. It wants you to adopt that mindset then, you see. That's the point. Because it hangs together. If you believe this, then this is the natural outcome. However, we have seen in this letter that God has a purposeful plan, right? This plan encompasses from before the foundation of the world, right? Ephesians 1, 4. Just as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, to eternity future. Let that truth renew your mind, you see. That's the truth. Let it renew your mind. The world says we are to find our own purpose. Without God, what purpose does the unbeliever have? Does the atheist have? They're big on saying lately, well, find your own purpose. And you can have a purposeful existence. (laughs) however renewed mind thinks of how each one of us fits within the overall scheme of God's purposeful plan you see where has God placed me how has he gifted me what kinds of talents do I have you see it goes beyond what the world has to say and its limitations You see, let that truth renew your mind. The world says to embrace and live by your own truth. That's very big. I I was hoping it would die out, and maybe one day it will, but, but it hasn't. Live by your own truth. Determine for yourself, it says, what is good and evil. That's what it's saying. However, the purposeful plan of God sets forth for us what is good and what is evil. It shows us what it really means to prosper in this life. It shows us that the truth sets us free. The world says that you will find contentment in following your own way. The renewed mind understands that contentment is found only in Christ and His course for your life. You think Paul was content there in prison? Chained? And and it wasn't like today, right? Where prisoners get brought food and we pay for it and all of that. Prisoners relied upon family or friends to bring in daily food and needs and so forth. But yet, Paul was content. He was content. I trust that you are beginning to get the idea here of what we're talking about, of what Paul is referring to here. What do you do with your mind to help it be renewed? Let me close out this section of Scripture by quoting from Paul. I I can say Scripture memory. That's a good way. Scripture memory. Put things in your mind and, and hide it in your heart. You see. But I want to quote from Paul in Philippians 4.8. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, remember the truth is in Jesus, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise,
think about these things. So let your minds be guided by these things. And then Paul says we are to put on the new self. Put on the new self. Verse 24. Before we dig too far into this, I want you to notice something important here. I want you to notice that it isn't just about breaking the habit of an old mindset. It is about replacing an old mindset with a new mindset, you see. In the same way, it isn't just about trying to stop bad habits. Oh, it's just so hard. It is hard. I'm not going to make light of that. It is hard to break old habits. To come to realize, you know, the way I've been doing things, I've developed this habit about doing it, and boy, the Lord has been convicting me, and I really need to change, and I really need to know how to break this habit. It, it's more than just that, you see. It isn't just about trying to break old habit patterns of living, whether in thought, word, deed, or attitude. It is about replacing those with new ones, with godly ones. In other words, instead of, instead of having this particular attitude that God has shown me in His Word isn't very pleasing, what does He say should replace that old attitude? What kind of new attitude do I need to inculcate into my life? to develop in my life, you see. And once I get this down, that goes. So listen to what the Apostle Paul says. And to put on the new self. Right? We're new creatures. We're new creations. Keep discarding the old. Renew in the mind. And put on the new created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. What is the overall goal of the course of our walk? What is the goal of growth? The goal is to put on the likeness of God. That likeness of God is not neutral. I would argue that Adam and Eve were created in true righteousness and true holiness, you see. And true knowledge, as he brings out in Colossians. They were not neutral. We are not neutral. And the likeness of God is not neutral. It is true righteousness and true holiness. What is the new self? The new self is that which is conformed to the likeness of God. It started when the Lord took out our heart of stone and replaced it with a heart of flesh. It is that which is couched in new patterns of living, including in our thoughts, words, deeds, and attitudes. All of these things should permeate our new life. Just so we get this clear, it is God who does the creating. We don't do the creating. Remember, you are a new creation. This is God's doing. You are not able to will yourself to be a new creation. Remember what we pointed out last time in 2 Corinthians 5.17. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed. Behold, the new has come. It is the living God who makes you, who recreates you in His likeness. This is no renovation job. This isn't like remodeling or updating certain parts of your life. It's not as if you can get the best proverbial paint in the world and look at the old stuff and just say, well, if I just put this good paint over it, it'll be better. Now that doesn't work. This is a total teardown and uprooting of the old foundation. Then a new foundation is laid, and isn't it interesting, 
that the Apostle Paul has already talked about the kind of foundation that was put in your life with Jesus Christ as the cornerstone and the foundation of the apostles and prophets and so on. And he has started building a new superstructure upon that new foundation. One day the body of sin will be done away and we will have glorified bodies that will always be oriented toward the living and true God. We will not be able to sin. That's just a great thought. Until that time shall come, we are to begin to become in practice what we will be one day. The new creation that He has made us on the inside. To that new heart we are in attitude, thought, word, deed to embrace and incorporate into our lives. So we must continue to be set apart to God. Holy, that's what holiness means. I am set apart to Him. Instead of being given over to corruption, we give ourselves over to holiness. And we put holiness into practice, which is righteousness. This is more difficult in our day and age, wherein society is now very accepting of sin. In fact, they look down on you and they condemn you and they call you all manner of names if you oppose what the world says is good now. Society is embracing the world's course more and more. We used to be a Judeo-Christian nation. We accepted certain values and tenets of the Scripture whether we believed in Christ or not. And as we have gone along, we have been sucked into, I fear, the world's course more and more. And it is seeking to make us embrace it as normal. Now we were abnormal just a few years ago. Now we're normal. And they want us to believe that. As the way things ought to be. We wrap up our thoughts for today. We must be careful in our walk. We must be attuned to the voice of our Lord and the Word of God to direct our steps. To stand firm here in this and say, this is, this is what I believe. And this is what tells me what steps to take. What to believe. What to hold fast to. And what to reject. It is more important than ever before that we remain steadfast and true. To consistently do so, let us continue to make the necessary course corrections in our walk with the Lord. Amen. Father in Heaven, thank You for Your Word to us. I know there was just a lot more that could be said. But it gives us a start. And we ask, Lord, that uh, You would help us in our thoughts, words, deeds, and attitudes to embrace a new course, godly ways of thinking, godly attitudes, godly words, godly deeds to the end that You, Lord, would be magnified in our lives and in the church. For that's what's most important. And we'll give You the glory through Christ. Amen.